Thank you, Les. I would like to invite. I would like to invite Marisi Bukavalas to come and give her keynote. <coughs> Thanks, Linda. Let's first of all test this. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, I think maybe we're doing the adjusting here. Uh, hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. We're just waiting for that to come up. Well, while we're waiting for the to come up, the the, um, the PowerPoint there. Um, good morning. Good morning. Uh, that's wonderful. That's a great start. Kalineras. Huh? <laughs> ah, good. That's even better. Um, uh, yes, us. <laughs> do, do you all know what that's contraction for? It's Stigiasas, and the native Greeks will correct my pronunciation there. Um, Stigiasas, and it means to your help. But let's go one better than that. Um, yamas. Have you heard of that? Yeah? That's um, Stigiamas. That means to our health. I mean, what better way to start a final session? Um, I want to invite you, if you'll do this, I want to invite you to join me in raising an imaginary wine glass yeah. and saying, Yamas. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Okay, beautiful. Um, we, oh, we're up. Okay, we're up. Good. Terrific. Um, I'm Marcy Gugavales. I have not, unfortunately, had the pleasure to meet all of you. It, it so many more. This is um, Nico. Excuse me, just one moment. I just want to make sure I got this right. This one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. All right. All right. We're all set to go then. Um, I haven't. I said I haven't had the pleasure to meet all of you, but I still hope to do that. We. Uh, how many of you are going to Festos to the to the site? Oh, that's terrific. Okay, good. Maybe we'll have a chance. This bus is there. Is a whole afternoon. Maybe we'll have a chance to meet each other. Um, I, um, I also want to, you've noticed perhaps um, the title that appears in the program uh, has a little augment to it. Um, it's reflection on the past, learning for the future, but the phrase, an invitation to dialogue. I heard the voices here, and they're pretty loud and clear. So I want to, I didn't go to the presentation, the, the night last night, I spent time trying to encapsulate my presentation into about 20 minutes. Because let me explain to you a little, as an advanced organizer, the, the structure of what we hopefully be able to do in a very precious 45 minutes together. Um, I, if you'll indulge me for about 15 minutes or so, so I can make a, a little presentation on my observations of the past, the past first of all meaning our time together this week. Um, but I'd like you to be thinking about your observations about this week and about the transpersonal movement in general. Um, because then what I'm going to do, I'm going to come up into the audience. You notice I didn't say down, right? Um, I'm going to come into the audience with a traveling microphone. <coughs> And um, we'll talk a little bit about that structure because what I hope to do is start the process of moving into the future as a result of our time together this week. And starting that um, by transforming an audience into a community. So just kind of keep that in mind in terms of what are your thoughts um, about our time together this week? What are your observations? I have about eight of them. Initially, I had 20, and I distilled it down to eight. Um, you may have others. Um, you may want some clarification, and you may have your own thoughts that don't, don't occur in terms of what I'm going to present to you. OK? Sure. All right. Do you want to know anything about me? OK, that way for later. Yeah. Yes, yes, OK. Um, so I'm a professor of human development at a um, mainstream university uh, just outside of Washington, D.C. And I've been doing that for almost 35 years now. And it's been quite a journey, um, for better and for worse, but we keep on moving forward on that. Um, I'm also um, editor of the journal Transpersonal Psychology. Um, and so I do a lot of juggling, uh, essentially. 
And I've probably been part of the transpersonal, having transpersonal experiences, although I didn't call it such since as long as I can remember, since I was a little kid. And that's probably what drew me, and probably many of you too, into a, a community of what I would call kindred souls. But it's equally important that we move more forward. And how are we going to do that? The, those voices have been repeated and resounding uh, probably all week, essentially. How are we going to do that? And that's this final session. What we hope to do with this final session, essentially, is do a little bit of reflection, but then start moving us into the future and see how we can do that as a community. Isn't it wonderful? Look at all the flags here. Um, 34, 36, what is it, Lindy? 34, 36 now? Something of that nature. So the first thing I want to do is to welcome you home. Uh, and it's really funny, I chuckled when Rosemary, uh, ESD, we're all be at Rosemary's session um, yesterday because she said, where was Rosemary here? She here? Yeah. She left, okay. But she said, ah, okay, good, there you go. Um, she said, um, I think I'm the third presenter that's actually put forth a plan about make it number four now. <laughs> here we go. Um, but it really is an image, isn't it? It's quite an image. Um, and it stirs us sometimes, someplace deep inside. Um, and if we can kind of keep that image in mind that we're a community, we're not just we're a community of scholars, we're a community of professional uh, practitioners, but we're a community. Um, and if we kind of keep that me message and that image in mind as we move forward, and if we say so long to each other, but it's so long uh, to each other um, until next time. Okay, so. We talk about reflection on the past. I started off saying about our week-long journey together, and um, want you to want to invite you to think about your takeaways from this week together. But you notice I have um, self with a lowest little um, lowercase s as well as with a capital S. So I think you all know what that means. So it's not just individually, what's your takeaway as an individual? Um, but what's the takeaway for the larger movement, too? What are you seeing? We have so many really terrific presentations. I mean, each one had a meaning, and the meaning overlapped in some ways. But if you could start thinking about that as we're talking right now, that would be very, very meaningful. Um, the past also, of course, is the transpersonal movement. And I see it as bio, psycho, socio, spiritual. So when we talk about transpersonal, we're not just talking about individuals. And almost from the inception of the movement, and I've been, I started studying transpersonal in the mid to late 1970s. It wasn't just, and it is not just about the individual. It's about the development of transpersonal development relationships or groups of organizations, and we've heard that here this week, haven't we? Um, and uh, so, reflection also on Greece. I think I just lost path in the orange microphone. Is that going to make a difference? Um, it, no, okay, okay, well then we'll just transcend that one, right? Huh? <laughs> um, okay, so, so Greece, Greece has a, I think, I think Greece is a transpersonal context. Um, I've had the privilege to um, be working with Lindy and her team from inception. Um, I had a Fulbright here in Greece in 2012, and um, so what I was studying at that time is how the Greeks are navigating the crisis. It was right smack dab in the middle of the crisis. You know, how, what's happening? How are they navigating the, and the economic crisis? Of course, turned into a social crisis, and there was also a political crisis, and there's a variety of different things, and this, that entails a whole presentation unto itself, but I'd be happy to talk with any of you. But the, the key point to me is that there was almost like a bifurcation in terms of some people being very, very depressed. Um, there were no more suicides than you realized. As I was talking to a colleague from Serbia yesterday, I don't know if she's in this audience right now, um, what, what, what I learned is that not all suicides are committed out of depression. Not everyone's depressed when they take their lives. And what I learned from this particular research is, to me, very transpersonal in nature. Um, some people, because of the economic crisis, um, felt that they were ill, they were old, 
and did not want to be a burden, did not want to be an economic burden, and did not want to be an emotional burden to their relatives and to their family and to their friends. Now, I don't know how you interpret that. You may interpret it differently than I am, but it's worth a discussion. And it really awakened me to things that might it not be possible. And then you think of all the suicide bombers which are taking other people's lives. But that's, I'm putting that on the side right now. Um, think about that. And if you want to talk about it, I'm hoping someone might really take that and run with it from a research perspective, as well as from a psychotherapeutic perspective, too. So we were pretty much in agreement that Greece that was a really ideal place to have this conference. Um, Greece has potential for metamorphosis because the other side of what I was talking about, the people who had taken their lives, I found a lot of points of light. I found little sparkles here and there of people who were learning to live with uncertainty. Um, people who were navigating and growing from the process. Now, um, they may be minuscule, they may not be that many, but they're there. And so I'm still studying, I'm coming back and conducting interviews, I'm trying to follow some selected people to better understand how are they doing that, because this isn't this part of the transpersonal, isn't this part of what we try to understand, how do people transform, how do people develop this larger sense of self, how do people get beyond um, their own basically psychodramas, if you will. So I had the privilege of being in Rosemary's um, pre-conference, and one of the things that came through on Greece as a transpersonal context here is, of course, the history of Crete. And I, I want to, I asked Jackie if she would just, just say a few words, because I think you can capture it better than I can, I don't want to say your words for you, of, what was that all about? Because, yeah, sure, yeah. Can you hear me? So we were talking quite a bit about um, one of Rosemary's interests, which is sacred geography. And Greece, for those of you who have any kind of Jungian background, is actually a temenos. It is a land mass which is surrounded by a closed sacred circle of water, which is connected, of course, to the unconscious. And so I found, interestingly enough, my understanding is there hasn't been a lot of rain coming through, but there was a huge storm on the weekend that we arrived, and it felt to me like something really powerful and new was actually blowing onto the island and amplifying the work that we were doing in the conference. So that a magical moment, a synchronistic one, I'm not sure what it was, but it was quite extraordinary to open from that place because since then it feels like lots and lots of things are shifting. Even for me personally, I'm feeling everything in my body instead of thinking things through. So new things are coming in with the winds, I think. Okay. Thank you, Jack. I really appreciate that. Um, and Jackie wasn't the only one in the session that experienced that. How about you? Any of you resonate with that? Wow, isn't that interesting? That's a research question in itself. What happened? What's going on here? Um, so, let me back up for a second. Um, what we want to also be thinking about, not only reflecting on the past, of course, um, what is the future calling for? How is the future calling the transpersonal? How and for what? And again, we've heard some of that during this week, too. So I would like to share with you, I initially started to call these themes and I tried to extract themes, but they weren't necessarily themes, more, at least from a scholarly percent, uh, perspective. Um, but voices. And this is my takeaway, and I would like you to think about yours with the recurring voices that I've heard this week. I don't know if you can read that from here. I'm not sure I can read it from here either. Let's see. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. So the first one, and I consider this prepotent in some ways, is there was not only a genuine, but a very, very deep concern 
for transpersonal psychology, and I have TP that's going to mean transpersonal psychology throughout, um, connecting with urgent social and societal issues. And you know where you are. Um, but that didn't stay as a voice, because what happened right away is it was almost like a groundswell. So you have people that move to develop networks. I mean, you may have developed a small network, but there were larger issues, too. I mean, there was a paper going around here. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to sign it, if you had to um, see Zana, where she is, um, of developing a transpersonal global network. Uh, there was another gentleman who invited people into his trauma institute. And please forgive me if I don't have the connection and the name. But I think that's pretty significant. Is one of the strong voices that it's emerged here from our week together. Um, but the issue to me is that I really, and another thing that emerged, in, but is near, near and dear to my heart and soul, is that we really have to be less insular. Um, I, I see the transpersonal movement, and some of you have heard me say this before, as transpersonal psychology and the heartbeat and heart throb at the center because we really are interested in the whole human species, but we can't do it alone. We really need the disciplines that deal with the macro context, um, the disciplines of sociology, anthropology, the disciplines that deal with organizational development and community development to partner. And I have a vision of a future conference um, that might have um, some name that says the transpersonal movement, but includes other disciplines and how we can work together and how we can collaborate. Haven't we heard that term all week, collaborate? Um, but then you have the whole movement, and it is really interesting because I had just written something about transhumanism, and I come to this conference and I say, oh, I'm not the only one. Um, how humbling and how heartening at the same time. Um, what about transhumanism? Transhumanism, of course, is um, the uh, enhancement of biology through technology. Uh, the movement began, the association for transhumanism began in the, officially came together in mid-1990s with an accompanying journal, the Journal of um, Transhumanism. Did you know that they changed their name? They're called Humanity Plus now. And the journal? The journal is called the Journal of Ecology and Technology. How's that? So anyways, the question, though, is um, can we collaborate? What is our role? Um, purportedly, they talk about ethical enhancement, but consumers may not be of the same persuasion. So, you know, it, we, we probably want to react, but how are we going to proact, too? How are we going to be proactive in that way? Um, the other thing is, are you familiar with contemplative education, contemplative learning? There's this new movement. Contemplative, new, right? Huh? I call it contemplative learning. And a new book just came out on contemplative learning across the disciplines. Are you familiar with that at all? Yeah, well, I just became familiar with it myself. It's just recently released. Well, they recognize some of the schools, like they recognize the California Institute of Integral Studies, they recognize JFK um, as universities who have been built and established on contemplative pr principles. But I couldn't find, to my knowledge anyway, um, any transpersonal theorist, practitioner, professional that's written in that book. So what do we want to do with that? Um, okay, then uh, my second um, voice that I, I've repeatedly heard over and over again is um, that transpersonal actually movement is, is wrestling with the same questions um, that have um, confronted in many ways the human species for millennia. Well, that's probably good. Um, depending what we're going to do with it, that's probably pretty good. Um, the third thing is about definitional matters, and I have the question mark still. Um, we're still dealing with definitional matters. Well, um, I suppose my, my, the position I'm in right now with regard to that is that um, it's a good thing because people at least are still talking about it. I mean, still using the term transpersonal. 
Um, the other concern I have that I've talked about on occasion is that I think sometimes we can become too precise because there's a difference between a definition and a description. And if we become too precise in our definition, we become too narrow, then we lose meaning, and especially multiple meanings. And so I just want to put that out for us to think about, because I noticed that, um, let me go to the next one, because, it, yeah, let me go to the next one, because they, I think they, to my mind, they connect. Um, transpersonal just seems to really strike a very, very deep chord among people. And ten I go up. Heartbeats resonate. And people I have heard repeatedly at this conference included um, say things like, ah, I've been doing that. Whoa. I have a name now for what I've been doing. And as we know, anytime you can name something, it becomes more alive and you can deal with it better too. Um, have you seen that at all? How people, it strikes some deep chord and sometimes don't mean people don't even know why, but they're called. They're called, essentially. And so I think those two things to go together, because sometimes people give their own definition to it. They come in from many different disciplines, very many different uh, professional affiliations. And I think we need to allow that to be, they have multiple meanings. As long as we're all around the same core, and there are some same cores, um, a wider, deeper, larger sense of, of, of self in the cosmos. Um, I have mentioned this before, that, but I heard it again here, is that beyond the individual, from the very beginning, the transpersonal psychology included um, the development of focus on relationships, groups, including the family as a group. Um, and uh, where, is, where is Stuart Savatsky? Is he here? Because he's been, I wanted to give a plug for his new book, Advanced Spiritual Intimacy. We're going to be reviewing it in the, um, in the next issue of the journal. Um, but he's been working on that for a long time in terms of relationships uh, and the importance of transpersonal relationships. Um, as far as organization, we, we're actually entering a new era. When I first started off really studying this territory in the mid-1970s, there were a lot of little sparks. And some sparks caught fire and blossomed and ignited, and other sparks are igniting more now, and I think this area of relating relationships and organizations is actually coming into greater awareness now. Um, how many of you are familiar with uh, Frederick Leloux's new book? Does that mean no one? Oh, okay. We're going to be we're reviewing that in the next issue of the journal, too. Okay, let me give you the title here, and I'm going to read this to make sure I get it correct. Reinventing Organizations, a guide to creating organizations inspired by the next stage of human consciousness. So, you see, he's working at the organizational level. Things that we've been talking about this week, too. That, you know, come to this alone. We need a society, and the organization's a central part of the society. Um, the good news about this, though, this is not just a theoretical book. This is actually based on case studies <laughs> of organizations that are actually doing this. Isn't that heartening? <coughs> I think I just... Uh, Could you say the name again? Yeah, let me just... Could you get that back? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the name again is um, Frederick Lalou. It was just published in 2014. And the name is, yeah, thank you very much. It's Reinventing Organizations, a guide to creating organizations, thank you very much, inspired by the next stage of human consciousness.
Okay, number six below here. I don't know if you can read it, so let me let me go ahead. Um, okay, just transpersonal psychology. We heard this repeatedly, also, right? Uh, transpersonal psychology was on the vanguard of what mainstream society has now embraced. Now what? Can we be on the vanguard? Are we on the vanguard of anything? Well, I think so. Um, and that deals with number seven. I know this is hot potato, so I'm just going to say it and then see what kind of dialogue emerges from that. Um, this has been discussed, and there are a variety of different, sometimes polar positions on this as well. And that's okay, you know, all voices need to be heard. Um, transpersonal psychology and the whole transpersonal movement challenges the worldview upon which the current scientific paradigm is based. So, the question that I end up with, you may end up with a parallel, maybe even a different question, the question I end up with is, for what areas of inquiry is the current science good, good? In other words, we have a lot of, like, we have psychometric instruments being developed. There are some areas where the current scientific paradigm is still very, very viable. I think we probably also need to discuss for what is it limiting and what do we do about it. Irving Laszlo, as some of you may know, has um, published, I'm just reading actually his most recent book um, on the cosmos, and I have that written somewhere and I don't have it in my head, my apologies on that. Um, but he's also coming out with a new book, as some of you may know, that he's it's scheduled for October, or already into October, um, and it's called The Immortal Mind. Have any of you read a preview on that? Anyway, I, this is communicating to me, and I'm not going to say making sense, because not everything that, that, that communicates makes sense, in the traditional sense of the word anyway, but what if, what if we are on the verge of a second scientific revolution? And what if, Transpersonal psychology and the whole transpersonal movement could be on the vanguard of that. I know those of us in academia have to, um, we have to stay within a certain in, in, in honor, and in some ways I still think it's viable, the current worldview and the current, and it's still good for some things, but what can we do to change that? I mean, obviously a change is needed if it's limiting some things that we can inquire about. When I was an undergraduate, I had a double major in psychology and sociology, and I took a whole year of experimental psychology, and I was telling some of you here at the conference, um, I asked all these questions. And my professor said to me, those are not research questions. And I said, well, who's going to answer all these questions then? And so he said, well, he says, you're going to have to leave that to the philosophers and poets. And I felt it was a little bit of a straitjacket, but he said something to me that's actually carried me the rest of my career. I didn't like it at the time, honestly, but uh, it's the rest of my career and to my international work, too. And that was, right now, you have to become the best experimental psychologist that you can become, because you have to talk our language. And once you're able to talk our language, we know that you're not avoiding anything. We know you can talk to us then, you're going to have credibility and other people might listen to you. So I kind of, that's been a takeaway for many, many, many years here for me. Um, and number eight, is this whole area that I've also heard repeatedly, and that's transpersonal psychology is like, it's, it's a whole transpersonal movement. Moving into the transpersonal terrain, terrain is a lifelong process. Um, what does that mean? It's not something that's done on a weekend. Um, it's understanding ourselves and the human condition in which we find ourselves, all of us, are in this together, and inviting each other into our understandings. Isn't that what dialogue is about, all about? Before we can dialogue, we really need to have deep understanding of what the other person needs. And perhaps you, as I, have seen situations that are called dialogue. 
And they're really not. Because people are trying to either, I don't agree with what you're saying, or I just don't understand what you're saying. And sometimes it's a little effort to really stop and listen, and listen with our hearts and our souls, as well as with our intellects, to what is this person meaning? What is their reality? And then, and only then, really can an authentic dialogue begin. So I just finished some writing. Some you know we struggle with the writing with words sometimes, um, and so I want to share this with you um, because this is the, what meaning as it came to me as I was writing is that in terms of being a lifelong process, developing into the transpersonal. Can you read that, or shall I read it? Read it. Okay. Deeper layers of understanding continually emerge as humans unfold in the cosmos in complexity, subtleness, sacredness, respecting the importance and uniqueness of individuals, groups, nations, in other words, the collective, not just the individual identities, but the collective identities as well, while heralding connections and sometimes these connections are untangible and unseen. But they're there. What's that all about? In both identity and being in terms of transcending these differences. So in other words, it's um, what Andres Anyo would call autonomy and homonymy. Uh, are any of you familiar with his work? It goes back to 1941. Um, autonomy is, sorry? Did someone ask a question? I didn't hear the name. Yeah, Andras Anil. I can give that to you. It's a. It's a Hungarian. A. Any Hungarians that can pronounce that better than I can in the audience? Like it's A N G Y A L. But, but we can talk about that. Yeah. Um, he wrote this back in 1941, and I've taken that. I found it actually in a footnote uh, to one of Maslow's books, and then I went and researched him to find out a little bit more about the person. Um, and he was addressing this to the whole human condition, the whole, all the disciplines, all the professions that, that are working with people. Um, and I, I, my image of it is like a double helix, where uh, there are complementary trajectories to human development. One is the autonomous, and they're both important. It's just that some cultures emphasize one over the other. And where we are, possibly, developmentally, as a human species, is to try to understand the importance of both trajectories. The autonomous, we know about. It's it becoming independent, separate self-sense. And a lot of the psychometrics, especially in the Western quote-unquote world, um, define that as maturation. When you're able to develop an independent self-sense. But homonymy is the complement to that. And that's the meaning that's derived in life by being and feeling a part of the greater whole. And of course, that can be worlds within worlds within worlds within worlds. We start off you know, becoming part of a family, becoming part of a group, uh, becoming part of a rah-rah sports team that we identify with. Um, the problem is that our development needs to keep on going until we recognize our homonymous identity as a planetary creature, and they're all planetary creatures. We're all human creatures on this planet trying to navigate together. What happens, unfortunately, is it truncates off. So people develop, um, um, let's say, an ethnic group. Um, I was brought up Greek American, so I was kind of, it was difficult because I was brought up in the United States. Um, so you develop this ethnicity, and so the ethnicity itself, what it does, it gives you a homonymous identity, a meaning by being and feeling part of a greater whole. But it can't stop there, and sometimes it does. And that's why we have wars, and that's why we have um, you know, people, hostilities, because um, one group is pitted against the other. So part of our challenge, it seems to me, in the transpersonal movement is maintaining, being able to maintain our individual identities, whether that's identity as an individual, as a racial group, as an ethnic group, but at the same time, recognizing that we're always part of some larger whole. 
and keeping our vision is like a bifocal vision. Um, or uh, Fritz and Fahey, the, the Princeton research is called open research. It's the kind of thing we do when we drive. So we're on the road, right? Okay, so we've got focus, we've got a focus. And, but at the same time, we have a larger field of vision. And we may do this, and we may not always, we've been driving for a long time, you're not aware of that. Um, but uh, that's what we're doing. They said, can we, can we translate that, since we do it when we drive, into our lives, and kind of hold that as an image, and allow people their identities, but at the same time, understand that there's a dual, the autonomous identity and a harmonious identity, and they're intertwined as far as developmental trajectory is concerned. Okay. I'm sorry, I cut out a lot of this because I want to get um, into you and just let you speak to. Um, so... Let's see where we are now. Oh, there we were, okay. Okay, so if we move forward now, um, excuse me, one of the things I cut out but I want to put back in again actually is um, I want to connect my research that I did in Greece here and what I discovered with what a wonderful event that we had the other night called the Council of Elders. Uh, is Tana here? Tana, no? Okay, well, you know who Tana is, hopefully. Um, but are you all familiar that we did a Council of Elders? Because there's one delightful woman, she was sitting at the back of the room from South Africa, maybe you can identify yourself, where are you? Um, that said, you know what? I've met a lot of youth here. Do they have wisdom? Shouldn't they be in the circle? And yeah, I mean, it's not just... You don't just get, I mean, a lot, a lot of people, a lot of us get old and we don't necessarily have the wisdom. Um, it, it's not an age-related thing necessarily. Um, but I want to connect that to my own research very briefly. Because, again, I had said I was researching how people were navigating crisis. One of my, you know, in research you have serendipitous findings very often. Well, one of my serendipitous findings was the elders. They were coming up out of their recluses, out of their retirements. And why were they coming up? They were called. And why were they called? Because they saw that they had something to contribute. And why did they have something to contribute? And what did they have to contribute? Well, these are the elders that are in their 80s and 90s that survived World War II. As some of you know, Greece was very ravaged. It was a very difficult World War II in Greece. And what did they do? They came up into the communities and they built uh, a council, so to speak, a council of elders, right? Not in all communities, but these are little points of light that I'm talking about. And they said, this is nothing. You should see what we survived in World War II. And people said, really? Okay, well, show us. How could it be any worse than this? We have to learn what to live with all this uncertainty. No, we have, you know, we never expected anything like this. We did all the right things. We saved. You know, we, we, we um, were cautious. We raised our children. What do we raise our children for? Should we send them to Australia, the United States, or the UK now? So the elders came up, and first, the first thing they did, they taught, they taught them how to um, barter. I mean, any of you Greeks familiar with this, the native Greeks here? Because it, it, it arose in a community in Athens first, and now it went up to Thessaloniki. And, and I really want to follow that pattern. I want to invite those of you that might be interested to come run with me on this, because I really think it's very, very important to our movement and to the human species right now. Um, so, the first thing that they did was um, talk about the other thing, and I, I mentioned this in the um, pre-conference there. Um, they, they taught them how to dig down, deep down into their hearts and souls and connect with each other. And to consider the I being a much larger I, the self being a much larger self. So, um, the community forum, and I don't know whether we're going to be able to do all of that, but let's start a little bit anyway. Um, 
my idea here was, and I want to offer you to as a learning format too, even if we don't get to do it completely, is that I want to come into the audience and the aspect of it that's really important is that it reduces the separation between the speaker and the audience, which is maybe an artificial separation anyway. Um, but the other thing that I see is it transforms an audience to a community as we try to move beyond the conference. And so these are the discussion points that um, I was hoping that we might be able to think about, if you'll think about this, and some of you may want to have uh, additions you'd like to make or anything I said, clarifications or elaborations, you might have your own elaborations. Um, your takeaway from this journey this week and your hopes and actions really important. Your hopes and action items for the future. Now, we could have done this in a linear process, but that really usually doesn't work well. So what I want to ask you to do is, um, I'm going to come with you right now. Identify yourself, who you are, and where you're from, and which these you'd like to say something about. From your perspective, from your experience, you may want to address all three, you might want to address one. Okay, is that is that clear? Yes. Okay, I got one yes. I have no one going this way. People staring into space. So let's let's give it a try for as long as we can do it anyway. Thank you very much.